So, as promised, I'm just going to say a few words here um, without much assistance from um, the slides uh, about how we come to books at a different level, how books um, appeal to us as, um, as texts, in this case, actually, as, as, um, as a script for reading, if you like, as a score for reading. Um, so the question here about, I'm just going to put on a, a couple of uh, key words uh, under the heading of approaches to reading. What I'm interested in talking about here is how books identify readers and how we as readers relate to or identify ourselves through books. So this goes back to that point about the novel or the poem or indeed the play script as an act of communication and how we become involved in this act. And that's what we're particularly focused on here. With the emphasis on us readers as full participants in the thinking process that any text puts into motion. Right, we're full participants along with the writers. The, the, the writers generate the texts, sure, but we as readers put life into the text in the same way, if, if you like, as a musician enlivens a score for music, or indeed actors do with a play script. So we're full participants in the, re in the thinking process that any text puts into motion. And our thinking as we read finds its shape through the unfolding poem or novel as we read, and as we project ourselves imaginatively into the scenarios presented to us. And for those of you who like a little bit of theory, a little bit of criticism, um, I'm p particularly um, identified here myself with uh, Rita Felsky, a literary scholar, who in The Limits of Critique, a book called the, the Limits of Critique, talks about literary engagement, that is engagement over critique, in ways that are very, very useful to how we're approaching reading in this project. In this book, the limits of critique, she distances herself from decoding and the hermeneutics of suspicion, I can gloss that in a moment, that, um, my pages are stuck together, that has become the default approach for literary reading really since the 1980s. Um, hermeneutics of suspicion, interpretation based on the idea that there is some secret in the text that we need to unlock, right? that we need to break open, like sort of cracking open a nut to get to the kernel. And rather, Felsky very helpfully wants to give acknowledgement, as, as do we on this project, to the full complexity of aesthetic experience that unfolds when we encounter a text or a book as readers. Here's a, a quotation um, from Felsky, where she says, interpretation or reading is fundamentally a matter of mediation, translation, what she also calls transduction. This is what allows books to move across geographic boundaries, across temporal boundaries, cultural boundaries, as they are slotted into new and ever-changing frames, she writes. Because if you, if you really think about it, it's quite remarkable that we are able to enter other worlds through our reading, through books. Um, you know, it's something that's often said to Key Stage One, you know, young readers, you know, the, a whole new world opens to you through this book. But it is actually something worth thinking about, how, and how that process of boundary crossing actually happens. And this activity of slotting into new frames or immersion, in, uh, involvement in alternative thought worlds correlates with, um, for me very um, interestingly, with J.M. Coetzee's thoughts on the sympathetic imagination, which he writes about in his book, The Good Story, which is actually um, based on dialogues that he carried out with a psychoanalyst. For could see in this dialogue, the identifications that are stimulated by the sympathetic imagination allow us to project ourselves into other mental states, right? So we, we enter sympathetically into the mind world of the book and also of the characters. He also writes, this is a quote from him, we, well, it's a very simple quote, we live other lives from the inside. We're not just looking at 
you know, these others, these other characters, if, as we're represented on book covers. No, we are living these, these lives, these worlds from the inside. In post-colonial contexts, including in Britain, often characterized by fraught forms of division, inequality, separation, borders, crisscrossing one another, this engagement, this, this sympathetic identification of bridging borders and translating difference can work in particularly effective and striking ways. And that's what we really want to explore when we have the, the discussions with, with the writers in the weeks ahead. A very interesting question, which is for another time, but is one that I'm hoping to pursue at some point, is whether these cross-border identifications, these sympathetic engagements, happen more intensely or um, with a greater frisson of excitement um, in post-colonial environments. Um, but it's a, that is a very, very big question. So reading then is no longer so much driven from the point of view of this project by the sense that the novel or poem is keeping something from us that demands decoding. So we can't, we're kind of not that interested in you know, what this metaphor is telling us. Um, we want to move beyond code and think rather about reading as a process of a continually unfolding process of inference gathering. This is why we're so interested in these recordings too. So we're constantly kind of taking it, I mean it's happening in a sort of nano microsecond way as we read. We're constantly sort of taking, taking on meanings, rejecting some as not relevant to the story being constructed and accepting others. But, and I think this is, a, this is an important watchword, to move beyond code in terms of our reading, in terms of the teaching of literature, is easier said than done. Our training in literary criticism, and this applies also to those of you who are A-level readers in the, in the room, our training in literary criticism conditions us to approach a poem or a text through a particular framework or frameworks in quite a detached way, as if the, you know, the, the, the book, the text is out there. Um, and, and it's something that we need to approach precisely by untying it, by cracking it open. So what we're keen to explore here is a much more inference-based mo model, which is temporally bound, like music, and really hard to capture. Um, but we're in, interested in, in getting hold of this interplay of flow and containment. At every point as we read, our thought is flowing onto the next word, yet also shaped by that word as it passes and as it interacts with the other words in the sentence. And here I, I reach to some a fantastic linguists called uh, Dan Sperber and Deirdre Wilson, who've been very helpful to me in thinking my way through this, this different approach. Um, they write that the addressee, if you remember the Jacobson's model earlier, the sort of the, 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 message, uh, the message receiver, is involved in a continual balancing of inferences concerning that act of communication that is involved in any book. To put it very, very roughly, um, as the sentence unfolds or unscrolls, meaning at once spreads out in the reader's mind and is channeled by it, spreads out, channeled, spreads out, channeled, as we process new elements, as we read. So all these elements are part of the communicative flow of, of anything that we read, any bit of text. And I would just like you to pause for us all to pause for a moment on this quotation. Um, I'll just read it and I would like you to observe as I read it, you've all already read it uh, silently, visually, um, as I read it, I try to observe what is happening for you in your minds, in your perception as you receive this sentence. Like a long-legged fly upon the stream, his mind moves upon silence. Which is 
from Yeats's um, late poem, The Long-Legged Fly. Like a long-legged fly upon the stream, his mind moves upon silence. Whether you know the poem or not, um, I wonder if people could just, don't worry about the microphone, if you could just sort of call out um, particular perceptions that come to you as you, as you read those, those two lines. I mean, what's most surprising about it is it's kind of the wrong way around in terms of the way you'd normally say that sentence. You say, it's your mind roots upon silence like a long way of fly upon the street. So you start off being abstracted from the thing that you're talking about. So you're actually forced to pay very close attention and follow the sentence word by word as it's being read in order to find out what the sentence is actually about. Thank you, Brian. Any other responses? It reminds me of the Ezra Pound haiku, uh, the apparition of faces. It sort of he compares it to petals on a red black So it's it's a very precise photographic image. So even in this, like Wayne said, I had to split up the first sentence and the second and look at parallels between the two to see how this image is created. So it forces you to focus. Thank you. Anything else? Yes, I think I never thought about a fly having long legs, but the sound of the language makes you accept that as really normal. Like, oh yeah, one of those long legged flies. <laughs> <laughs> With all the L's. This may be a really. Yes, thank you. Yes. I'm thinking a lot about movement in these two lines because uh, first you have the fly, you have the stream, you have the moves, and inside of that is the. Uh, it's quite a trembling silence, isn't it? It's a, it's, a, it's a silence held in tension because there's, there's movement and there's stillness at the same time. Um, the long-legged fly is still presumably on the surface of the, of the stream, but the stream is moving, it's, it's right? It's the, the movements of the falls, you know, the, the, the violence created the Yes, no, no, great, great. It's also in the silence is the constant, right? If the long legged fly is the mind and the stream is the silence, instead of it being consciousness as a stream interrupted by silence, it's the other way around. It's silence as a stream interrupted by a floating mind, which is quite. Or well, not even interrupted, maybe perhaps just. Or visited. Or yes, visited. Yeah. Mm. Possessed. Mm. Immersed. Yes. Thanks for those those uh, remarks, um, I, 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 as I think they've all been suggesting, I mean, I'm really going to state the obvious now, but I think you know, it's, it's, it's worth doing this when we're reflecting on the very, very complicated process that is reading. We are holding more than one thing in our mind at once when we read that, right? It's, we move very, very rapidly from the, the simile word, which we, in a sense we can disregard. It's, you know, it's right at the beginning and we can put it to one side. And we have fly, we have surface, we have stream, we have mind, we have, we have stillness and movement together, dynamically together. Um, and for me, there's something very interesting, perhaps the most, one of the most interesting words because it's a directional word, is the word upon in, that, in, in, in those two lines. Because it's, bo it's both, there's, there's a signification of up, being on the surface, right? But there's also a, a, a signification of being held, being suspended, up, up. Um, so, um, that was, pardon the pun, just skimming the surface. But, um, how then do we then approach reading of central importance then for, for us, and we're going to keep exploring this as we go along, is that reading or interpretation is not something done to a poem, a novel, a text. It's not an invasive or aggressive act, a dismantling, unmasking, breaking down and un unpicking. Instead, comprehension and interpretation, reading is what happens in the course of, as it were, receiving the the book, the text, through the play of meanings as the text or the poem presents itself to the reader. 
So reading then, the readings that we're very interested in are readings that don't attempt to extract some, some latent, some buried meaning in the text, some repressed message, some deeper interpretive code um, that lies behind the, the, the words on the page, um, the meanings seemingly on the surface. A rather reading sets different currents of suggestion and implication running. Um, so, quoting here from um, a cognitive theorist, Mary Crane, and this is my final bit of, if you like, um, I don't know, uh, critique, I suppose. Um, when reading, Mary Crane writes, we do not need to add theory to our experience of the text, but rather register what the text itself is saying. It's that active communication that we're paying attention to. So our task is to follow our readings as we read, think about how we are receiving the text. <clears throat> 